Um, so this is all the work I did during my thesis, and I work with Yasha. Um, okay, so I do symplectic geometry, so I care about symplectic manifolds, which are even dimensional smooth manifolds with a symplectic structure. Uh, so something that is closed. Should that be that? Yeah. If, you, if you could somehow find a way to move it off screen. Might go to more through the hide option. There should be a hide option. Hide view panel. Beautiful. Okay. Okay. Um, so the form is closed and non degenerate, which means if you take its nth power, it's a volume form. Um, an example, but just the example I work with, is R4 with um, the symplectic form. Dx1 wedge dy1 plus dx2 wedge dy2. So I write my coordinates in pairs. Um, and that, if this is like with caveats, it's not exactly like this, but you can imagine if you have a surface, you're sort of taking two projections onto these two planes and taking the areas and summing it up when you're taking it into just a way to imagine things. So there's some areas involved. So we get about some special submanifolds, which are Lagrangians, which are half-dimensional submanifolds. So if you're looking at R4, we have surfaces um, <laughs> such that um, the symplectic form vanishes on uh, the submanifold. Okay, so, um, so an example for R4 would be just the x1, x2 plane, right? Or it could look funky, but if you take any sort of surface on it, this integral would be zero if needs something more specific. But this is maybe a boring example. So we want to know how can we visualize these things in R4, which brings us to Lagrangian movies. So the idea is we think of the y2 coordinate as time, okay? And if you take a slice, so if you fix a y2, you're looking at um, a hypersurface on R3. And each R3 will intersect my Lagrangian um, in a knot, so in a one manifold. So um, if you look at this example here, suppose you have um, in different Y2 slices, this sort of circle that's growing and then shrinking back, what you're getting is an embedding of S2 into R4, yeah? Um, now, so then if this is a Lagrangian, we call these circles uh, Lagrangian slices, okay? And there's a, um, suppose you have a family of links or knots, and you want to know whether it's a Lagrangian, there's some sort of differential equation which will tell you that, but we don't need to worry about it, but it's there. So there's some conditions on your family of functions. Okay, but this can let us draw some good pictures. Um, so there's a Whitney immersion. Um, this is giving you an exact Lagrangian immersion. So there's one double point, which is in blue in the center, like the equator sort of intersects itself. Um, and it's exact. So each slice, um, like each of these, when you project to the X1, Y1 plane, the signed area it's bounding is zero. So it has some more properties than just being Lagrangian. Um, sort of related example. Okay, sort of related example is this uh, Clifford torus, which is um, an embedding of the torus into R4. And the slices look like that. So the beginning part looks like this, but then you do something different in the middle. Okay, so now that we have this, um, sort of a big question that I want to ask is sort of what type of Lagrangians exist in R4? And that's difficult and it's also a little vague maybe. Um, so with these pictures in mind, we could ask um, what are sort of possible combination of slices? Like uh, if I just draw random things when they come as Lagrangian slices together. Um, we're going to try to make this a little more precise. Oh, oops. Okay. Um, a way to ask this is, 
which nodes and links are Lagrangian covariant. Okay, so what is a Lagrangian covariantism? So a normal covariantism is a surface with um, one dimensional boundary. And I'm asking, when can you embed it into Lagrangians? But I'm lying a little here. I'm not saying enough about these knots for this question to be uh, valid. Like here it's drawn like this, here it's drawn like this. Um, can you draw it however you want? To make that more precise, we make a definition called um, enriched knot diagrams. So if you've done some knot theory, um, you have knot diagrams, which are usually an immersed curve um, on your paper. So this is called the blackboard framing. So we have x1, y1, sort of this thing, and the x2 coordinate is pointing outwards. Um, and we have these signs to keep track of which crossing it is. Okay, but the enriched part is I'm also going to keep track of areas of these sectors that this thing cuts out. So here I've drawn it without actual intersections, but those are all intersections. It's just easier to keep track of crossings for me. Okay, so then uh, once we have this definition, we can um, ask it a little more precisely, when is there a Lagrangian? Uh, suppose I have two diagrams, pick any two of these. Um, when is there a Lagrangian so that the bottom knot is given by uh, diagram D1 and the top knot is given by diagram D2. So the bottom and top, yes. So uh, is the data that you're keeping track of just the data necessary to know if there's a Legendre lift? Okay. No. no, so many of these don't have Legendre lifts, okay. um, depending on what you're doing. Either eight plus or eight minus has a Legendre lift. Um, in my thing, only eight plus does. Okay, so no Legendrians. Um, yeah, um, and by top and bottom, I mean top and bottom in the Y2 coordinate. Okay, and if such a Lagrangian exists, we define this relation uh, that D1 undercuts D2. Do you have a question? No. Okay. Um, and then we get some results on like when such things can exist. So the first result is this eight plus um, knots, which are really are knots. Um, if you have a plus crossing, um, then this lobe has to grow. Um, okay. And the opposite happens if you take the minus crossing, the lobe has to shrink as you go upwards. Yeah. So this relation is not reflexive. Now, this result was proved by uh, Josh Slavloff and Lisa Trainer using generating functions in a 2008 paper. Um, you Sorry, could... I think I'm a bit confused about oh, what, yes. exactly. what exactly is the, the data that you're inputting? It's a, the knot is in R3. The knot is in R3, and you're keeping track of this area, which is uh, you can say you're projecting to x1, y1, and the lobe area you're keeping track of. Okay. So these two are sort of the same diagram, except that the lobe is bigger and smaller. Okay. Okay. Um, you can also get results like this. Uh, so my techniques are different from generating functions. I use holomorphic curves. Um, but yeah, and you can get results where the top and bottom don't look exactly the same, but then you still get some area conditions of which should be bigger than which. Um, but then you can also uh, tackle things like truffles with uh, my stuff. And this, like, depending on whether the crossing is a plus type or a minus type, the central triangle in the trefoil is growing or shrinking if there is a Lagrangian covertism. Um, in these cases, we don't know whether generating functions are there. So um, you can also, uh, if you want exactness, if you're, um, then you can add some lobes and it still works. Okay, so these are the sort of results we can prove. Um, and I'll spend rest of my time trying to tell you how what sort of ideas go behind it. Yeah. The, the fact that all of the inequalities are strict means that, that like essentially none of the examples here, none of the knots that you have here can go to itself. Yes. yes. Are there examples where it can go to itself? 
Um, it, if it has to go to itself, you have to sort of have that uh, this height here is zero, um, which means you have to like have something which is just a circle sitting inside x1, x2 or something. I guess I had, yeah. It's a very degenerate case. Um, yeah, like you sort of just have to have something sitting in x1, x2 and you take a cylinder. Um, yeah. But otherwise, you'll always have to have strict inequalities. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Okay. Um, okay, so techniques. Um, so suppose we have a Lagrangian probabilism. It's an embedded object in R4. We add these small colors to like close up these gaps so that now I have an immersed Lagrangian and these uh, boundaries are lying inside copies of R2, right? So I just reduce this height and it's exactly the projection that we were looking at. Okay, how does this help us? So if I take the standard complex structure on R4, which is C times C, um, then this R2, which is the X1, Y1 plane is a complex uh, plane. So that pink disk that I've shaded in, uh, it's a holomorphic disk with a corner, but it's a holomorphic disk. And then, ah, so now you can like ask if that is allowed to move in R4, uh, what does this model X space look like and what are its boundary points, blah, blah. Um, so we want to track down which of these are one dimensional um, and depending on these signs, we can get um, one dimensional manifolds and they turn out to be compact, which I've not written here. And um, turns out that these ones that we are starting with, which are sitting in this R2, are boundary points. So if you have a compact one dimensional manifold with one boundary point, you better have another boundary point. And we're looking for this other boundary point. Um, ah, okay, it's compact. Um, so the work was to sort of characterize what the boundary points of these one dimensional modular spaces can look like. And what do we do? So we show that this one dimensional modular space has to have even number of boundary points, which sort of look like one of these things. So either, so I define a horizontal disk as the one sitting in one of these x1, y1 planes. Yeah. Um, so either it has to be the horizontal disks that we start with, or it has to be a combination of horizontal disks and non horizontal disks. But the non-horizontal disks have some strict sign conditions. They can only be like this plus and minus that we define, which is a little technical, but it sort of reduces the number of options we have to very few. And once we track down all the options for um, these boundary points, you can look at all the horizontal disks, so I've like colored them in pink and yellow, and comparing these things sizes give us the results that you're talking about before. So yes. Are the boundary conditions then? And are the signs like the mass of the mass? Uh, no. So the signs, um, how can I go back? Okay, so we can see here. Um, here, when you went in like the holomorphic direction, which is anti clockwise, at the corner, you jump down. Um, so, and, so if you jump down, it's a plus sign. And if you jump up, it's a minus sign. And we make the same definition for anything that's not horizontal also, because the Lagrangian is sort of transverse. And there's clearly one which is like higher and lower. So the same, it's just extending this definition. I, I couldn't define a good mass Okay. Um, and then tracking these gives us those results. Um, I guess there's some like future questions. Um, usually when people do things with holomorphic disks, there's like some algebra heading. So we're on the hunt for this algebra. Um, so everything I did here was sort of looking at the model I space and seeing how these uh, holomorphic disks break. But you might want to understand gluing and that becomes a little difficult because I um, fix the holomorphic structure, so I'm not in a generic situation. Uh, so we have like 
negative to uh, virtual dimension disappearing. Um, so you have to, um, yeah, I'm writing that down. Um, yeah, and then like there are a lot of other abstractions that it looks close to, like Julian was like, oh, is there, are there Legendrians? So some of these can be Legendrians. And then like, how does it relate to existing theories? Maybe it's something to ask. There could be a lot of questions. So you use the BGA in that thing? Sorry? You use the John and BGA in those cases? I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it doesn't seem to work. You don't have like homism math or something? No. I don't even have a homology yet. Yeah. Okay, that's that's all. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. So um so like if I were to like say what you're kind of studying with intrinsically, like our like you're basically it seems like you kind of have like on each of the R3 slices, you sort of have a like uh, something where the restriction of the symplectic form vanishes, like a one manifold on which it vanishes. It's kind of like a Legendrian, a little bit. Um, and so then the- Not really. So um, when I talk about these diagrams, uh -huh. okay. Um, I then, so we are only keeping track of some areas. We're not keeping track of these heights, which is- uh, I see. So that takes away sort of the, um, yeah, okay, we can look here. So all of these results hold for any knot irrespective of what these heights were. Yeah. And also I could like lose symmetry or like squish it or something. Um, so the, they're not always Legendrian, not- I, No, but I'm not saying they're like exactly Legendrian. Okay. They're, they're kind of like a generalization of Legendrians where like the different, the, the symplectic form restricted to the end still vanishes on them. Um, that we can talk about this later. I okay. Think. This is maybe like not a little bit too open ended. Okay. I have one more question. Oh. Okay. Let's... Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. We can keep talking afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.